Good morning, Mountain Shadows Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Rachel Srubas, and I'd like to welcome you to this service of worship for Sunday, April 19th, 2020, the second Sunday in the season of Easter, the season of our risen Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to offer up some words of thanks for those co-leading this worship service with me. Always I thank our director of music, Charmaine Pione Dame. Today, Charmaine has collaborated across social distances with our church member elder Dorothy Grimm and her clarinet. You will hear a duet created by the two of them. I'd also like to thank our church member and photographer extraordinaire, Gay Russell, who has provided images that will enhance the visual component of this worship video. And I would like to thank our preacher for the day, Pastor Laura Monroe. Laura has been worshiping with Mountain Shadows Church along with her husband, Brad. She has recently completed a year's service as a hospital chaplain, and she will very soon complete her studies toward obtaining a Master of Divinity degree from Fuller Theological Seminary. And later on this week, Laura will take her ordination examinations toward becoming a Minister of Word and Sacrament in the Presbyterian Church USA. So won't you lift up a prayer for Laura especially as she approaches those important exams, and as she brings us today God's word and her proclamation of it. God bless Laura, God bless Charmaine and Dorothy and Gay and all of us who are gathered, even though we are in our separate homes, in our separate places. We are united as one congregation centered in Christ, caring for community. Christ is really present wherever two or three or more are gathered in his name. So let us worship God. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Resurrection joy is ours. Our risen Savior Jesus Christ is with us. We rejoice in the blessing God has poured into our lives. Though we experience vulnerability and fear, we are called to believe. Though the shadows tempt us to hide, we live in the light. Thanks be to Christ who has overcome the bonds of death and goes before us, leading us to follow him. Alleluia. Amen. Hear the call to confession. Like Thomas, who walked the Judean countryside with Jesus, we may have trouble believing in the resurrection. Easter and its celebration have slid into the past, and we may feel ourselves backsliding into denial and fear. Trusting God to lead us toward healing and freedom in Christ, let us pray. Vulnerable God, risen Lord, we have not seen you nor touched your wounded hands and side. Yet you are present in our lives and we are thankful. See the ways we are wounded. 
Notice our unhealed histories, and in your tender mercy, soothe and mend us. Often we don't understand ourselves or our impact on others. Gaze on us with wisdom and gentle judgment that invites us to grow into the likeness of Jesus. He breathes your peace upon us, welcoming us to become people who no longer hold on to sin, but let the painful past go so a fresh new life with you may begin. Hear and know our needs for your forgiveness and mercy. Sovereign Savior, you listen deeply to our stories. With compassion for each person, you meet our needs for forgiveness and restoration. You favor us with love and blessings, and all we need is to say in Jesus' name, Amen. We need not fear, dear friends. Jesus is among us, offering us new life and hope. Nothing can prevent God's love for us. Rejoice! We have been made new in Christ. Alleluia! Amen. A Reflection on the Peace of Christ by John W. Martins Christ's peace does not inoculate us from the reality of the world and its warfare, not from psychological or physical pain, not from arguments and bruised feelings, nor will the peace of Christ mimic greeting cards, sappy sentimentality, and make certain every day is sunshiny and happy. The peace of Christ is the gift of eternal life that transcends the vicissitudes and losses of this life because it offers the deep joy of salvation which God gives and the world cannot snatch away. May the peace of the risen Christ be with you. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, 
Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Sovereign and merciful God, let the scripture and these words work in all of our hearts and minds. Give us peace and reveal your will for our lives. In the name of our wounded Savior, I pray. The Sixth Sense, a movie which came out in 1999, has an iconic line, I see dead people. Cole is a schoolboy who is haunted by dead people, and he teams up with a child psychologist, Malcolm. Together they find peace for young Cole and redemption for Malcolm. In an opening scene, Cole tells Malcolm about a time when he got in trouble in school. Cole says, We were supposed to draw a picture, anything we wanted. I drew a man. He got hurt in the neck by another man with a screwdriver. Malcolm asks, You saw that on TV, Cole? Cole responds, No. Everyone got upset. They had a meeting. Mom started crying. I don't draw like that anymore. How do you draw now? Malcolm asks. Cole answers, I draw people smiling, dogs running, rainbows. They don't have meetings about rainbows. At the end of the Gospel of John, after Jesus is crucified and buried, the disciples tell Thomas they have seen Jesus. Thomas does not believe that the disciples saw Jesus a dead person by all accounts up until that point. Thomas needs to see Jesus' wounds. In the sixth sense, dead people appear to Cole with their wounds, and he can tell how they died. By getting to know their stories, Cole moves from being terrified to feeling compassion and empathy and seeking justice on their behalf. The Gospel of John tells of the resurrected Jesus appearing with his wounds. The wounds are the way the disciples and Thomas know Jesus. The wounds lead to an astounding proclamation by Thomas. Jesus does not show up victorious in a glorious rainbow. Jesus is our resurrected Savior with wounds. We have meetings about this. Jesus comes to the disciples, not as a ghost, but in bodily form. Jesus appears so that his disciples can see and believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing they may have life in his name. Jesus comes with his wounds to meet their needs for forgiveness and restoration and to offer them new life. After Jesus is crucified, he meets with the disciples where they are gathered behind locked doors they are afraid and vulnerable. Jesus' first words to them are a blessing. Peace be with you. Jesus speaks these words only one other time. It is in Luke's gospel, also when he appears to the disciples after he is resurrected. As soon as he is in the midst of his disciples, Jesus offers a gift of peace. The Greek word also means love, forgiveness, favor, and blessing. After Jesus appears, he offers his blessing, and then he displays his wounds. Jesus shows up to a meeting 
and reveals his wounds. If you think about it, that is a very strange thing to do. Most stories have their victors show up and show off the spoils of victory, but Jesus flaunts his wounds. What is even stranger is that the first time Jesus shows up for the disciples, they don't even respond when he says, peace be with you. Only after he shows them his hands and his side do they become overjoyed. They know him not by his appearance nor his voice, but by his wounds. And it is his wounds that make him real and cause them to become overjoyed. But when they go and tell Thomas the great news that Jesus is back, Thomas does not believe. Our globe is experiencing a sense of collective disbelief and mistrust at the moment. We sort through the news reports trying to discern what information is true, what is intentionally misleading, and what might be wishful thinking. Anyone under the age of 106 cannot remember experiencing a pandemic. And so it was hard to believe for most of us at first. It was easy to minimize the seriousness of the reports until the numbers of hospitalizations and deaths were revealed and the virus was at our doorsteps. Now we feel vulnerable, and it is hard to trust when we are vulnerable. Maybe Thomas doubted his friends for this reason. Perhaps he thought, there's no way I can trust you to have really seen Jesus because I know how much you want him to be alive. Seeing the marks on his hands from the nails and putting his finger there and putting his hand in the wound on his side were for Thomas the way to know for sure that this Jesus-like being was actually Jesus. Thomas was not able to trust the perception of his fellow disciples and would only trust a firsthand experience in the wake of their devastation over Jesus' crucifixion. I can relate I might be more doubtful of the truth of Jesus' bodily resurrection if not for John's account about Thomas. I like evidence, and I don't always trust the perceptions or reports of others, especially if they are distraught or desperate. I can be guarded about getting my hopes up, particularly when I am in survival mode. For me, the story about Thomas makes the account genuine and believable. Jesus' followers did not all blindly believe from secondhand accounts that Jesus came back, nor were Jesus' followers sore losers who needed to, at all costs, prove they were right. Jesus came to them in bodily form, and it was his wounds that convinced them. Furthermore, Thomas, who was not with them, didn't believe their report. He wanted tangible proof that Jesus was walking around again. So Jesus came to a meeting in a locked room again a week later to see the disciples. Jesus offers his blessing of peace and then speaks directly to Thomas as if he knew exactly what Thomas had said. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it to my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas then says, My Lord and my God. The disciples became overjoyed when they first saw Jesus' wounds. Thomas proclaimed Jesus as his Lord and God. This is the only account in any of the Gospels in which Jesus is addressed as God. Thomas' confession of faith is the most exalted confession of any of the Gospel confessions. He calls Jesus Lord and God. Jesus' wounds are his glory. We still have meetings about Jesus' wounds because of those who saw and believed. Jesus' wounds are his glory and Thomas's doubt becomes our blessing of belief. The disciples failed Jesus at the end of his life and Thomas doubted Jesus' resurrection even after his friends told him about it. Jesus met them and responded not with blame, not with judgment, not with demands or directives, but with compassion, vulnerability, and blessing. Jesus, our victorious Lord and Savior, teaches us the power of vulnerability through his wounds. 
Jesus models the power of compassion, mercy, blessing, and woundedness. God became vulnerable in an unmarried woman's womb. God was vulnerable as an infant refugee. God was vulnerable as a rabbi who thought differently and taught differently. God was vulnerable as a Jew in a land oppressed by Roman rule. God was vulnerable as a Jew who practiced peace when zealots and rebels took up arms. God was vulnerable as a falsely accused man. God was vulnerable as a wounded convict hanging on a cross. Our sovereign, vulnerable God appeared as a risen Savior with wounds. His disciples knew him by these wounds, and they were overjoyed. As we face our own vulnerability to a microscopic invader that has altered our world, many of our illusions of stability and security, may we find comfort through the faith we have in Jesus Christ, our wounded God. It is okay to own our vulnerability. It is okay to sit with this and listen for what God speaks into our wounded lives in this wounded time. We have an opportunity to experience our faith and God's glory in a context most of us have never faced. We have a chance to grow in our compassion and empathy for the most vulnerable who have never experienced the luxury of illusions of security and stability. May we bravely allow ourselves to trust, believe, and see how God is doing powerful work in our experience of vulnerability and hold in our hearts Jesus' words, peace, love, forgiveness, favor, and blessing be with you. When the time is right, we can go out with our wounds showing. We can share the blessing of Jesus who comes with his glorious wounds to meet the needs of this wounded world for forgiveness, restoration, and new life. And may we get to have meetings about this again. Amen.
Let us pray. Wounded Savior, risen Lord, like your disciples, we are sometimes afraid, sometimes full of doubt. But in your extravagant generosity and boundless love, you appear to us in our fear and our fragility and grant us your spirit of peace. Thank you for loving us as we are. Remind us that although we are in a time of global suffering and grief, the signs of Jesus' resurrection and new life are all around us. We rejoice today with the family of Joy Lewis, whose granddaughter, Catherine Eileen Lewis, was born on April 14th. Thank you, God, for Catherine's new life and for calling us all your beloved children. As we remember this day those who suffer from illness and loss, Lord, help us to be a comfort for them. We pray your blessings on Charmaine Piane Dame and family as they grieve the death of her aunt, Thelma Rice, giving thanks for her life and for the great gift of resurrection. For those who need healing, we pray, O oh God, for a beloved sister, Melanie, for Karen's health and wholeness, and for Jeff, for health care workers, Jamie, Pam, Nat, Callista, Elizabeth, Karen, Eric, Jeff, Suzanne, Chuck, Jenny, Aaron, Emily, and her husband Kevin, and many others. We give you thanks for Joyce's successful surgical procedure, for the encouraging news the doctor shared with her and Ed, and we pray for Joyce's full healing and recovery. For those who are lost and alone, separated or alienated from family and friends, we ask that you empower us to connect with them in compassion, offering appropriate help that will lift them into new life with you. We pray that your peace will be with all people anywhere in situations of disease, conflict, or struggle, that the dangers will be overcome by your good news. For our community and our nation, Lord, we ask that you give to leaders empathy, wisdom, and awareness that all lives depend on your mercy and care. Grant us an extra measure of faith so that, as our own vulnerability makes itself felt, we may accept it with grace and confidence in you emerging as strong witnesses to your love. In Christ's name we ask all this, praying together the prayer he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We've come to the end of our service of worship for today. There's just one more word to offer, a charge and benediction that I will give in a slightly modified form. And it is this, stay home in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all beings, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing always in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with us all. Together let God's people say, Amen.